relations, including the government and the family. Based on the principle of what is called in Chinese, Ren, this word means human-heartedness. That's the nearest we can get to it in English. And it was regarded by Confucius as the highest of all virtues. It's above righteousness, justice, propriety, and other great Confucian virtues. And it involves the principle that human nature is a fundamentally good arrangement. You're listening to Human Centered Politics. So, to those of you who have heard of Andrew Yang, or have, especially to those of you who have not heard of Andrew Yang, I wanted to share something uh, that he's been saying a lot at his rallies recently. Uh, that has really resonated with me, and it might be something that you might not expect to be particularly resonant. But one of the things he's been saying that I'm just thrilled with is that he's going to be the first president uh, with a PowerPoint deck at the State of the Union. And this has gotten a massive response. I mean, people have literally been chanting at the at the L.A. rally. You can watch the footage of this. People chanting, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. <laughs> Which I think is just great. It's because what he's saying is when when he elaborates on it is that what he would like to do is present facts and data and statistics at the State of the Union about how we are doing as the American people, rather than what he calls this bizarre theatrical performance. And I agree with him one hundred percent on that. By the way, you know he talks about people they stand up and, and clap and sit down at these sort of like rehearsed intervals. And now the whole thing, it's its really bad political theater. And what do we really get out of it? And most of us, you know, don't watch it or find it unwatchable. You know, it's its older voters and political wonks who are watching the State of the Union address. And usually I watch like half of it or a little bit of it and, and, and turn it off. Even if it's, you know, Trump's or Obama's, I mean, the recent ones, which, you know, you would think... Um, you know, no, no, you know, it's just, I, I, I don't really have the stomach for it. I'll, I'll watch the clips through the soundbite later, you know, as is kind of even my attitude and I'm a huge political junkie, but it, the state of the union is just such a, it, it, it's so, there's something so like fake about it and, and so much pretense that goes into it. And so, but one of the things about this, what Yang has been saying and the response that I've seen to it. I mean, these are, this is something they talked about in a recent NPR uh, feature or mini feature. Um, they did a, an kind of feature on the new presidential candidates you may not have heard of, you know, Andrew Yang and John Delaney, and I forget the other one at the moment. I think it was maybe Jay Inslee. But in their segment on Yang, uh, one of the things that the, the hosts were saying was, oh, that's too much numbers, too, too much math. You know, he's going into these statistical responses and, and, and speaking in these elaborate paragraphs. It's not going to land with the voters. What voters want is something emotional, and um, that's what's going to resonate. They want someone who's going to go in and rile them up and, and, and speak very emotively and very, um, you know, I, I, I just don't, I don't think that's true, honestly. You know, I kind of thought about it. I'm like, that is the conventional wisdom, I suppose, yes. But on the other hand, out of all the people that I know, I feel like we're, the 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 sentiment I feel like is way more common is people just being hungry for a politician who's going to come in and be a problem solver, right? And when when someone's a pro going to be a problem solver for you, um, you don't really mind them going into the detail of how they're going to solve your problem, right? If if you hire someone, if you hire a plumber uh, to fix your pipes, and even if you don't really understand all of the, the technical terms he might use, if he's using any, um, and explaining what he's going to do, you still kind of want the rundown, and you want somebody who can effectively explain it. You don't need to him to get you like emotionally riled up about, I'm going to fix your pipes, because you already know that's a problem that needs to be fixed. I don't know. Maybe that's a weird analogy. Uh, the point is, I think what people are wanting out of a politician now, which is, is evidenced by Trump, whether you love him or hate him, people are screaming America the, the Trump election in 2016 that was a cry for help I, I think it's very hard to, to see it as anything other than a cry for help from a distressed America especially distressed middle America and you know there's various interpretations on how Trump won that we're actually going to go into that's going to be one of the the topics I'd like to get into on this first episode actually of why Trump won the election 
because I've seen some people dispute uh, the explanations that uh, Andrew Yang has put forward. Um, but I think it's, it's worth talking about. But in any case, you know, I, I think that this completely refutes the, the conventional wisdom that I heard on NPR um, where they're talking about it's not going to land with voters if you, if you start going into math. You know, when Yang says, well, I ran the numbers, I went into the numbers, people cheer and hold up signs that say math on them and there are people wearing hats that say math which is an uh, anagram, or, or sorry, um, is it an anagram? Or I guess it's a, uh, you know, it's like, it's like scuba, um, where, where it's self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Um, acronym, acronym, that's the word I'm looking for. Jeez, that's, generates a lot of faith in your, your host, right? And it's the first episode. Anyway, math stands for Make America Think Harder. Which I think is just great, too, that, that Yang is – and, you know, I, it made me kind of think that there's something a little bit insulting. Maybe it's like self-deprecating or self-flagellating about the conventional wisdom about the American voter of how stupid the American voter is. You know, like there's always this caricature that comes up every election cycle where there's candidates that stand up that people say, hey, that guy's really reasonable. He's making a lot of sense. And there will be some naysayers that stand up and say, anyone who makes too much sense, uh -uh, they're not electable. Um, you know, the only people who are electable are the guys that we all hate, <laughs> which to me makes zero sense. It's like on the face of it, it's kind of absurd, right? Um, but that I, – and I think that reflects sort of like in the elitist bubbles, especially people in the, the mainstream media or the establishment media. That's probably why that caricature has survived. For so long, because that's sort of what they, they think of all of us. Like, you know, we're these fat, um, stupid, you know, cheese doodle eating. I mean, you know, at least in the mid Midwest or in the South, um, where I live, um, you know, I live, this, this is coming from Austin, Texas, by the way. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of like in the, in the South, but not really. Um, but you know, I've been all around the South and the Midwest, um, you know, and, and I can definitely see why you would have that stereotype of the, the slovenly, you know, uh, moronic American, Average American, average Joe American, not being too bright. At the same time, though, just going back to the, 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 the example of like when you're hiring someone to solve a problem, you don't really, you know, it's a point I've heard made before, um, I think by Matt Dillahunty, actually, um, that we, we want, when people talk about somebody being an elite or, oh, they're not going to appeal because they're going to come off like they're too brainy, like, we want a brainy surgeon operating on us. Like we want the elite pilots to fly the planes that we're in. And in like any in area of human endeavor where we really give a damn, we actually want somebody who is, is smart and makes a lot of sense and looks like they're qualified. Um, and for some reason, the conventional wisdom has been, well, we don't want that kind of person to be president. I don't know. Y you can look at past elections where the American people have really screwed the pooch, and maybe Donald Trump is one of those uh, examples, and use that to, as evidence that the American people really are just completely stupid. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think at this point, um, maybe the fact that we've had such a media barrier, an information barrier between ordinary people and... Um, you know, what's actually going on in, in terms of like a candidate's popularity and, you know, what that candidate stands for and what they're like. Um, because as we've seen, there's already been a ton of, of media dishonesty this election cycle and it hasn't even begun, which we'll be going into and covering on, on this show. And in the past, people had no way to call that out. There was no Twitter. There was no YouTube. Um there was no way for you if 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 you for example in a lot of these polls that we're seeing where Biden is polling at you know consistently at like above twenty five twenty seven percent before he even announced his run which he did today and you know Sanders is a close second or you know a, a distant second sometimes and as Kyle Kalinske has pointed out on Secular Talk I mean these are phone based polls where they widely sample. Um, out of older Democrats, they mainly sample out of older Democrats. Obviously, when you do a, a phone-based poll, that's the demographic you're, tar you're targeting most of the time. A lot of these polls, you know, if their margin of error is 5.2%, as the Emerson polls margin of error was, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't even see how that qualifies for it being a scientific poll. So, you know, we've been fed all this in false information from the media or skewed information from the media for so long with no way to really... Um, answer it or correct the record as ordinary people and voters 
And so hopefully uh, that historic shift that the internet has provided will make this election um, just even more transparent than the past ones. And, and hopefully that trend will only continue in that direction. That is actually a promising trend that doesn't get talked about a lot, is that through the internet and through being able to mass organize, um, we have made our elections that were becoming more and more opaque. We've actually been able to, to countermand that to some extent through the public, making them transparent by being able to speak out and call politicians to account when they lie and call the media to account when they lie, which I think is great. But anyway, to, to get on to the topic of, um, you know, what human centered politics is, which I have been leading up to this whole time, um, all has to do with that PowerPoint presentation that Yang says he's going to give at the State of the Union. Uh, because the the scorecard that he says he's going to bring up um, is key to the his policy, or one of the three pillars of his campaign, as he calls it, which is human-centered capitalism. And so what I'm talking about with human-centered politics is inspired by much the same thing of, you know, Yang says that we need an economic system that is geared towards promoting the flourishing of human beings, you know? And so in the, the same way, I want to take a political approach that's based on what matters to human beings. You know, what do human beings need to live? What do human beings need to flourish? What do we think is important? Um, so, you know, by no means will this be a, just a pro Andrew Yang uh, show. That's not my intention. I, I, I'm not, I, and in fact, I'll be critical of Andrew Yang at many, on many points. And there are many ways in which I disagree with Andrew Yang. Um, and I will also there, I have other candidates that I like as much as Andrew Yang in some cases. Um, and I will give credit where it's due, uh, to anyone who's correct on any issue. Um, and I will call someone out if they're incorrect, even if I tend to agree with them on other issues. But in any case, uh, my, my big area of agreement, and I guess I would say why I'm excited about Andrew Yang and why I have become a supporter of his is with this American scorecard of what he says he's going to report on. Um, so, you know, and just as an example of what it would be like, this is what he says, that these are the, some of the things that we should be, be measuring. Um, medium in, median income and standard of living. Levels of engagement with work and labor participation rate. And so that's a really important one because you'll often hear about this headline unemployment number of how un unemployment is so low. When really, you know, like 94% of the jobs that have been created in the past... Uh, a few decades have been gig jobs, you know, temporary contract work that generally don't have good health care or, or a good path forward to a career. And our labor participation rate is at a multi-decade low at 62%. Um, so, you know, that this headline unemployment number, it's a little bit deceptive. And, you know, so going down the list further, what other things Yang says he would focus on, health-adjusted life expectancy, childhood success rates, infant mortality rates, Surveys of national well-being, average physical fitness and mental health, quality of infrastructure, proportion of elderly and quality care, human capital development and access to education, marriage rates and success, deaths of despair, despair index, substance abuse. Um, so, oh, and you know, and further down on the list, skipping a couple, he talks about environmental quality, you know, the quality of our air and water. You know, how, how much pollution is there? Global temperature variance and sea levels. Um, so all of these things that a market that's just strictly based on, on free market forces driven by, by profit motive is not going to necessarily care about all these things. And one of the things Yang talks about is how many people wake up in the morning think, thinking, oh, I'm so excited to make such a big contribution to GDP today. We hear all this talk, especially from the Trump administration, about how we're driving up GDP. We're driving up GDP. And what Yang says is this GDP number is going to drive us off a cliff when we're focused on that. But meanwhile, our, our life expectancy rates have declined for the past three years, which was a statistic I've been shocked to heard. And I, PolitiFact rated it mostly true. Basically what they said was, um, if you look, we're talking about like a, a, a percentage of a percentage decrease um, and it, what it actually is, is it went down like four years ago, it stagnated, and then it went down for the past two years. Um, th that might be like a little too complicated for Yang to say, so I don't, I don't give him any, I don't think he deserves much criticism for that, for simplifying it down, just saying, well, it's declined for the past three years. Because as PolitiFact notes, he is correct that the last time that happened was the Spanish flu epidemic, um, roughly 100 years ago. And it's virtually unheard of in a developed country, especially for the, the supposedly the richest 
wealthiest, most prosperous country on earth. And because we're talking about how, how great our economic output is while our people are dying. And the reason why that, that we've seen this decline is an increase in drug overdose and suicide. So Yang says, I'm going to stand before you at the State of the Union with a PowerPoint deck. And as he goes down this list, you know, you'll see on the drug abuse section, well, we have eight Americans dying uh, every day from drug overdoses. So let's try and reduce that number by 50%. And then he's going to come back the next year and present again and, and report on the progress. And, you know, this is something that, you know, uh, a company that I, I've worked for in the past would regularly have meetings with their employees and, and give updates like this about, like, how we're actually doing um, in the business. He's talking about reporting on this, though, not, like, in terms of profits and sales and, and, and all that type of thing, but how we're doing as a country. And this is uh, this is probably my main motivating factor in voting for Yang, because one of the things that he's pointed out is that what he can actually do as president is just walk down the street at, to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and say, you're going to change the measurements. You're going to start publishing these new measurements, a lot of which of those, those things that I've listed there on the scorecard, we already have measurements for. It's just a matter of the government now is going to officially say it's going to have to own the fact of, you know, oh, suicides have overtaken car accidents as a cause of death in our country and in our society and report on that. And that's going to change the dialogue immediately. And I think a lot of people might tend to, like, underestimate that, that we need a huge policy change. That isn't, you know, that the same as a non-binding resolution. I mean, no. When you have the president, a man who's been given sort of, like, the most, the highest, most powerful platform in the country to talk to the American people and engage with the American people. And this is what he's saying is, I'm going to have a numbers-based, data-based, scientifically-based, factually-based um, administration that's going to look at the real data about how we're doing as human beings and work in concrete, substantial ways to address those problems. To me, that seems like the most reasonable thing I've heard a candidate for president say in my entire lifetime. And that's where Yang earned my vote. So in other news, let's talk about Joe Biden, who announced today. Joe Biden put out a, a video, which I believe was entitled, America is an Idea, where, you know, he begins with quoting the Declaration of Independence. And there is dramatic, almost, I would say, cinematic music playing sort of in the background behind, as Biden reads, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And, you know, I just watched or rewatched National Treasure because I saw it went up on, on Netflix. So I just saw Nicolas Cage, like, a day or two ago, reading the Declaration of Independence while really dramatic music played behind him. So this just seemed maybe extra farcical or extra quixotic because of that. Because Biden is super serious. I mean, you want to talk about bizarre political theater. That's what this is. Because, so... He goes in, he says that, you know, America's an ideal that we don't always live up to. And even Jefferson, you know, the man who, who penned this, um, you know, he, he didn't live up to it, which, as we all know. But he says that sort of like the, the nadir of this um, failure to, to embrace our ideals uh, is Charlottesville. Because in the violence that happened there, as we all know, in, in August of 2017... Uh, we're in the aftermath. Trump equivocated the anti-racist protesters with the neo-Nazis and the alt-right protesters uh, who were at the event, uh, you know, one of whom killed somebody at the event during this whole incident. And Biden says that, you know, that's when he knew uh, then and there uh, that this, this was the worst threat America has faced in his lifetime. Um, so let's talk about some of the threats America has faced in, in, in Biden's lifetime. Um and personally, I would say one of the biggest threats to the American people during Joe Biden's lifetime uh, was this incarceration state that we've seen just rise, this authoritarian uh, mentality, um, this war on crime, war on drugs, um, t you know, tough on crime mentality that Joe Biden was a huge part of and that he was a huge uh, contributor to. And I, I want to thank Kyle Kalinske for for doing stories on all of these, but I just want to run down the list uh, very quickly of some of the things that, that Joe Biden 
uh, said and did during his Senate career. And this man who's now running for president, um, you know, trying to contrast himself against the, the, the hate of Donald Trump. So early in Biden's Senate career, one of the first things he did was to fervently oppose uh, desegregation measures, in this case, busing desegregation, um, basically taking, you know, setting up a, a system to where to, to bus kids from other areas of different cities that had formerly been segregated and to basically use busing to make these uh, schools actually more inclusive because the reality was after you know the civil rights act after the end of desegregation in the 60s going into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s even and even today as people will, will argue to various extents and many schools and many communities there still is for all intents and purposes uh segregation i mean it's it's de facto it's not de jure segregation and basically um hot on the heels of this one of the measures was well let's provide busing let's let's make these uh these classrooms more diverse actually desegregate them biden opposed these measures and he opposed them in opposing them he worked with segregationists in congress and the senate and he received praise from segregationists moving on in the 90s joe biden was uh bragging on the Senate floor, talking about working with Strom Thurmond, who, if you don't know who Strom Thurmond is, he's a very, um, he's one of the politicians who was old enough that he was in the Democratic Party back when that was still like the party of, of segregation and racism, and basically flipped over to the Republicans following the Civil Rights Act and the presidency of LBJ and the, the Southern strategy, and became a Republican. And Strom Thurmond you know, he did like the longest filibuster ever in 1957 to oppose the Civil Rights Act of 57. So that's the kind of guy he is. Um, and Joe Biden, you can find C-SPAN footage of him saying, well, you know, thanks to the leadership of Mr. Thurmond, uh, uh, I take some credit for as well. There's now a death penalty for drug dealers. For drug dealers. He's saying, if you, if we find out that you're dealing large amounts of drugs in your community, um, you can go to death. That's how he puts it. You will go to death. It's it's very bizarre. He brags in this um, sort of bizarre rant on the, the Senate floor about getting the death penalty for drug dealers and about um, bringing about civil asset forfeiture, which is a policy where the police are able to just seize your property. And it's actually a, a guilty until proven innocent standard. You actually have to prove that the property wasn't used in the, the commission of a crime. But, you know, if they find you out you're that you're a major drug deal for, dealer, for example, uh, they can take your house and your car, and they don't even have to prove that this had anything to do with income earned from drugs or that you used it to deal drugs. Joe Biden uh, went on another bizarre rant where he talked about how rehabilitation just doesn't work. It's almost a direct quote where he said, we just have to accept rehabilitation doesn't work. Um, he, he says it, it, it he repeats the term it doesn't matter over and over again in reference to it you know it doesn't matter what your circumstances were growing up it doesn't matter if you were poor it doesn't matter if you didn't have access to resources in your youth it doesn't matter if you grew up around crime and poverty we're, we're not going to take that into account we're going to lock you up and throw away the key is basically the gist of it and rehabilitation doesn't work and so in all of this you know for joe biden to say um, well, this is the greatest threat facing our nation is the hate coming from Donald Trump. Well, you know, you were B Joe Biden. You participated in legislating hate. You, what is that? When you when you were trying to fight desegregation measures and set up laws so that we can kill drug dealers. That is that's a legislation that is you legislating hate onto our law books. That's what that is. And it, it's. We've no, we know now, based on the science, how untenable our drug policy is and how the war on drugs has just completely failed. You know, we're, we're pumping $800 billion a year, I believe, or, or $80 billion a year. One of the, I know there's a huge difference there, but I'm trying to remember. Um, it's some obs obs obscene amount of money that we're sending to, you know, Mexican drug cartels every year. Um, we have a huge drug problem in our, our prisons in the United States. So that that's a... That's a guarded fortress, right? That is a, a walled, 
city with armed guards, and we can't keep drugs out of our prisons. So what is this fantasy that we're going to keep drugs from, from you know, entering the country, that we're going to stop the supply as long as there is still a demand? It's, it's absolutely Looney Tunes. And, you know, also just this notion that by punishing people hard enough, by making them suffer enough, you'll make them want to stop doing drugs. That's what our drug policy is based on. If you cause people enough pain, um, then they won't want to do heroin anymore because they'll know their life will be ruined if they keep doing heroin. Well, unfortunately, I mean, anyone with a brain can see that that is absolutely ridiculous. That's not how drug addiction works. People go to addiction out of desperation and depression and because they are suffering. And they're looking for a way to anesthetize themselves to escape from reality. So if you make their reality even more oppressive, you take away their dignity and make them suffer as much as you can, they're only going to have a, an even greater demand for drugs. You have to rehabilitate. And it, it's, it's just funny that we can't look at these countries like Norway and the Nordic countries in general, the Scandinavian countries, and most European countries, in fact, most other developed countries who are more geared towards rehabilitation. And what do you know? There's, their recidivism rates are just a fraction of ours. They're, they're incredibly low. What we're doing here doesn't work, and now we are incarcerating, like, a quarter of the incarcerated population on the planet is within the United States, and 1% of the U.S. population, I think a little more than 1% now, is incarcerated. So that's 1 in 100 people are incarcerated, and we, you know, just the, the 80s and 90s, we just saw this fervor in the cable news cycle, and we saw all these politicians who were so eager to be tough on crime... And to associate themselves with being anti-drug and anti-gang and being tough and just this, this competition, this race to the right wing, this race to authoritarianism. Who can be more authoritarian? Who can be more draconian in their punishments towards drug dealers, towards the people that we've criminalized by making drugs illegal for, for no reason, right? Because if you want to stop drug use, making drugs illegal, the data is perfectly clear. It, that does not stop drug use, so why are we doing it? There's no reason to do that. Well, we've, the reason why we've done that is to keep people oppressed, keep people in poverty, um, keep people ruined and broken and in shambles. Um, and maybe that's intentional, maybe it's not. That's the, but that's the effect of it. And Joe Biden was a huge part of that. Joe Biden contributed to that. And so you may look at all that and say, like, oh, well, he's, the, you know, he's not running on a platform of, of, of resisting desegregation or of segregating. He's not running on a platform of executing drug dealers. Um, but, so, but then that raise the que- raises the question, what does Joe Biden really believe? W- what does Joe Biden offer? And I would suggest to you all, if he didn't get it right when we really needed him to, then what good is he? If he couldn't get it right that the wrong thing is segregation, the wrong thing is executing drug dealers the wrong thing? Is the government or the police just unaccountably taking your stuff and you having to to make a plea that will be evaluated to see whether you get your stuff back? That that's the the way the system should work. Um, you know, I, I I just if he if he couldn't get all that right and resist all of that rather than doing the opposite and pushing that and trying to to reify that into our legal system and make that the law of the land as hard as he could working with people like Strom Thurmond and he's going to run now as like I'm the anti-hate candidate I'm the one in contrast with Donald Trump and the part that that really gross grosses me out is when he says um you know I can't stand by and let this happen he said he says if Donald Trump's you know what's happened so far I think history will look at it as an aberrant moment um, but if he gets eight years, he's going to alter the character of America forever, and I can't stand by and watch that happen. As if none of the other candidates could possibly defeat Donald Trump, and that we all need Joe Biden's help. The great white savior, Joe Biden. Um, and it's just ridiculous. Like, it's absolutely absurd. Um, there are plenty of other candidates, Joe, who, who, who are capable of beating Trump, who are not you. And, you know, you, you running as this anti-hate candidate... It's just ridiculous when you look at his record. He doesn't believe any of that. These, these highfalutin ideals that he is putting forward, of the, that the, this idea that he claims America is, Joe Biden doesn't believe that because he doesn't believe in anything. Like if his voting record is in any indication, either he's lying now or he was just, you know, 
when when the chips were down and when we needed him to stand up against the the authoritarian zeitgeist, he didn't do it. He participated in it. So, you know, what makes you think he has a working, a functioning moral compass? I don't think he has one. And, you know, so this and then, you know, I the thing is, most people are going to reject Biden because of the allegations of him, like groping women, so, which I haven't even brought up because, you know, I, I think he's a terrible candidate regardless of that. But that certainly doesn't help his chances. You know, I, I don't really believe in the uh, I, you know, I did call him, a you know, the great white savior. But that's like I mean, that, you know, it, for him to to, to posi- position himself as the anti hate candidate when he was like linking arms with segregationists to get like legislation passed to me is just ridiculous. And so, you know, and he's going to use the fact that he was Obama's vice president, that he was the vice president to the first black president. But if you know anything about politics, you know that he was put there to balance the ticket. He was put there to appeal to the older Democrats who may have been uncomfortable with electing the first black president. So what does that tell you about Biden if he was there to balance out Obama? Because that's exactly what he did. And, you know, just to, to, to put a little bow on my reaction to Joe Biden's announcing, uh, there was uh, recently a little talk that they had, I believe it was on uh, CNN, where they had uh, voters from Florida, Democrats, and three out of eight said Biden. And what they all said, they raised their hands to basically say, yeah, well, I really think Biden can win. I think he's the only guy who can unite the party. I think he's the only one who can win. They didn't say anything about his policy substance. They didn't say anything about what they were excited about. They, the, the only thing they were excited about was like, well, we think he has the most potential to win. You know what the only policy that was brought up in that segment was? Uh, Andrew Yang's freedom dividend. Because multiple people bring up, uh, actually the person I like is Yang. Because he actually has a plan to move us forward. Um, so, you know, yet again, it's that reasoning that's just so silly to me. We don't like Biden. No one, none of us like him, but he, uh, we think he can win. It's like, what? Uh, people win because you like them. And obviously there are a lot more likable candidates than, than, than Joe Biden. Now, I'm not going to deny that there are people who, who like Joe Biden. And I think there's a very simple explanation behind the people who like Joe Biden. I think we, America, we, based on the trends that culminated in Donald Trump, there, there's been a big movement for change and a big movement to challenge the establishment and for a populist movement, and for an anti-corruption movement. You saw Obama run on hope and change. Whether or not he actually delivered is another question. You saw Sanders run. He got shut down by the DNC, but he called it a uh, political revolution, and he's calling it that now, and he's a the front-runner candidate. I'd argue he's more popular than Biden, despite what you would see in polling. I think that's deceptive. Uh, and then Trump, of course. You know, we're going to go drain the swamp. We need to change the establishment take on the establishment. And I think with Trump, because it has gotten so crazy uh, in the eyes of a lot of people, they want to go back to they're, – they're looking at Biden for the first time. A status quo candidate can like run on that. They don't have to do like fake populism. They don't have to like pretend they're going to change things. Biden is literally just saying this is an aberrant era with Trump. Let's go back to the way things were. And he's branding his candidacy as like a third term of Obama, the status quo candidate. So it's like now we're getting status quo on the face of it. It's not even he's not even pretending to be progressive or forward thinking or visionary. He's saying, let's go back to the to what, Joe? We're gonna go back to the Halcyon days of the nineteen nineties? Is that what you want to go back to? I, I mean it's just absurd. And and the idea that it's an aberration that that says to me that he is not willing to look at the problems that got Donald Trump elected. That he's willing to chalk it up as his campaign ad suggests to racism and the the basket of deplorables. Whereas I think anyone who's politically keyed in know we have much bigger problems in this country with income inequality, with people losing their jobs to automation, with these awful trade deals that um, just have, have outsourced so many jobs, with people not having Medicare for all, not having health care. You know, the idea that we're going to have a status quo candidate, who's that going to appeal to? It's going to appeal to baby boomers, to older Democrats, to older voters. And honestly, I don't think it's going to land. I think they're going to cover the hell out of that segment of the Democratic Party that thinks Biden has the best chance and we all need to just unite around Biden. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. I think my prediction that I'm calling right now, I think Biden is the Jeb of the Democrats for 2020. He is their establishment pick. 
um, you know, associated with past administrations, kind of, kind of like a, you know, well-connected legacy establishment candidate who's going to kind of say, I'm going to come in and and make things business as usual. (laughs) Sorry, Joe, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, and, and I, 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 just one final thought on the Joe Biden thing. I think it's very funny that people have criticized, uh, Donald Trump for his support of dictators, people like, uh, Duterte, who, you know, he, he's, he's told his, his citizens go out and kill drug dealers, just be vigilantes and, and hunt people down. Um, and he's, he's bragged about like throwing people out of helicopters on at least one occasion. And people are disturbed that Trump has, has shown some support for this guy. But if you vote for Biden and you're the kind of person who's disturbed by Trump's support for that, I just want to point out you're literally voting for a guy who wants to kill drug dealers, who's like one of his policies in the past that he actually did and that he actually put forward when he had the power to do it as a lawmaker. One of the things he actually did was get the death penalty for drug dealers. So you're voting for someone who actually has more policy similarity to Duterte than even Trump does. So any potential Biden voters, I would just urge you to think about that. I wanted to give a quick response to the YouTuber uh, Nico House, who I have a lot of respect for. Uh, I like your content a lot, Nico, if you're listening. So, you know, I say this all um, just as a respectful um, critique. Um, but obviously I'm a Yang supporter and on your coverage of Yang's, uh, CNN town hall, uh, you said a couple things at the beginning. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to c- cover really quickly. And then another question, which seemed to be one of your main critiques of him that I've been hearing a lot that I think is really important to address. So the first thing is, um, you said that it seemed like he got the easiest town hall and that made you very suspicious. The thing is MSNBC has left Yang off of their list of candidates, even in the running. They'll show Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard, but they won't put Yang's picture up there. And this has been very well documented. Um, I'll put up some of the evidence for this uh, in the episode description. But um, CNN also did a last-minute change where they moved up his town hall an hour. They did it on the night of the Game of Thrones premiere, and they did it right after Marion Williamson's town hall. So... You know, probably not the best warm up for for the Andrew Yang town hall. There were there were a lot of factors, but it seemed like designed to marginalize him. And we didn't see like a whole lot of growth to the subreddit statistics or to the the number of donors after the CNN appearance. And as I said on MSNBC, they're doing their best to ignore him. Um, Yang has not been getting treated well by the mainstream media. They've most I think the the what they've realized is they can't ignore Sanders. They have to smear him. But with Yang, smearing him is not a good idea because then people look into it and they see that that UBI proposal, and it's just too, it's too much for them to deal with. Like, it, it it's too dangerous for people to be exposed to. And I think they're thinking because you know he has a a lower chance of like trumping the primary than Trump did in 2016 because of the the way the process works. There's the super delegates, which make the situation a lot more dangerous, but also a lot harder for an outsider if things go into the second round and he doesn't have, you know, the, the decades of name recognition that Trump did or the millions that, you know, the ill begotten millions that Trump did. So point being, I think they've decided, let's just keep his name recognition as low as we can and just talk about him as little as we can. And they gave him a town hall, um, after a, there was an internet petition to do so. And I think they're thinking, well, that'll shut them up, but let's try and keep him the internet candidate. Uh, as much as we can. So I have not seen that, that positive media coverage that, that you've seen um, in comparison to like the other candidates. I would say Tulsi Gabbard has definitely been treated more badly by the media. Um, but that's just because when they do talk about her, the smears are just so, so awful. Um, but the second point was the, the idea that it's politically naive to attribute Trump's victory in 2016 to automation. And I completely disagree. So one study that, that Yang cites, um, you know, and I'll, I'll put all this up in the episode description, um, the, the estimates seem to show that it was about 20% due to outsourcing that uh, where a lot of these jobs went away, but it was about 80% due to automation. Um, and I would recommend looking into Yang's interview with, with Trey Crowder, who is a, a podcaster, liberal podcaster from the South, who talks about this. And he does talk about the very issues that... that Nico House brings up that, uh, you know, in his, in his county, in his town, there was a factory that they literally moved all those jobs to Mexico. 
So you can imagine the kind of, you know, that rage that welled up. But, you know, Yang's point is, despite all that outsourcing that happened, still the vast majority of these jo- this job loss was due to automation. And, I mean, the data is pretty clear that we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs. And if you look into what happened, um, those people, half of them left the workforce, never worked again. They had, like, at the top end, 15% success for government retraining. And of the people who dropped out of the workforce and never came back, half of them are on disability now. Um, you know, some of them, some of those are undoubtedly getting addicted to opioids and dying or falling into a depression and dying. Um, so it's a very bleak picture. And what Yang found in his book, The War on Normal People, or what he elaborates on in his book, is that there is a straight line up in the voting districts that were in the swing states that Trump needed to win, those voting districts that flip for Trump, it's a direct correlation between the adoption of industrial robots and uh, that district going for Trump. And one of the things that Yang talks about to bring this up, because, you know, one of the things that Nico House says that's a, a valid criticism is like, we shouldn't be over, over simplistic about this. There was all these factors. It was these terrible trade deals. And I think it's a fair criticism to say that Yang does not talk about these uh, terrible trade deals enough. He, he definitely should. Um, and I would love to hear Andrew Yang's position on TPP and on NAFTA. Um, but he hasn't talked about them as much because uh, he's really focused on the problem of automation because, in his view, this is really about to take off. And I, I don't think that we can discount that as, as like a main factor because Yang doesn't claim it's the only factor. He basically just claims these were – at the margins, those, what was it, forty to 70,000 voters in the Rust Belt, but basically all of these swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win, all those states that went for Trump, all those voting districts that, that flipped those states for Trump, a lot of those people had just seen their jobs get automated away. And, and, and Yang was not making the case either that, you know, these Americans, like, did the research, <laughs> you know, these people in the Midwest went and, like, looked into it and said, oh, automation's taking my job. No, Trump came in and he riled them up with racist sentiment about immigrants are taking your job, you got to be scared of the Chinese, China's kicking our ass and everything. Um, so he spun a, a racist right-wing narrative. And we also have to consider, you know, people such as Sam Harris have pointed out, I believe the way he phrases it is, not everyone who voted for Donald Trump was a racist, but you can bet that almost every racist likely voted for Donald Trump. So, I mean, yes, there were plenty of other factors. And, and you know, a big factor was the people uh, dropping their party membership from the Democratic Party who were disgusted at what happened to Bernie Sanders and who didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton, who thought she was a terrible candidate. Um, and in a lot of ways, how this was like the culmination of the lesser of two evils thinking that nobody liked their candidate. They were basically vote, voting against the other candidate, probably the majority of the people who voted. Um, you know, maybe that's controversial to say it's speculative, but that's kind of my opinion, just bit anecdotally kind of. But, you know, in any case, the, the point I'm trying to make here is like, well, why did those voters drop out of Hillary Clinton's campaign? Was it because she didn't campaign there in the Rust Belt? I think that was a big part of it. You know, the, yeah, they were discussing Bernie Sanders' treatment, but why was Hillary Clinton so unpalatable? You know, because she didn't speak to those concerns. Because when Donald Trump, you know, is out there saying, make America great again, she's saying America's already great. She's saying Medicare for all is something that will never come to pass. You know, saying I'm for TPP and then kind of like tepidly saying I'm against it later. All of these things, you know, she made it clear she was not standing up for the working person. And Donald Trump, so she wasn't even addressing the problems. Donald Trump was addressing the problems, but he got them completely wrong. You know, he's saying the working person's getting screwed over by immigrants and, you know, people in foreign countries. And we've been getting stabbed in the back, basically, that sort of narrative, which was a lie. But what Andrew Yang is saying is, like, at the margins, those people that that a final push that he needed to win... The reason why those people were, were left out to dry by America was automation. The reason why they didn't find any you know, identification with the Clinton campaign was because the Democratic Party had abandoned its base of blue-collar workers. And the reason why they went for Trump is because he sold them a narrative about immigrants and uh, about you know, xenophobia and being scared. And, and, and Yang backs this up with data, by the way, that... It lowers your IQ by a standard deviation when you can't pay your bills. When people go into financial insecurity, it makes them enter the mindset of scarcity to where you're more bigoted. Because, and this is true, 
it actually requires executive functioning to resist like racism, sexism, homophobia, all those things of like, just, oh, you're other, you're different. I'm going to reject you and hate you and, and blame you for, and be distrustful or suspicious of you and all that, the source of all this tension, all of those things too, you have to actively resist that cognitively. And if your cognitive capacity is being basically challenged and overburdened by the fact that, you know, you've got all this medical debt or you have to choose between paying for medication or, you know, buying food to feed your family, it, 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 it drops your ability to reason logically. And so we're making our populace more stressed out, more angry, and more susceptible to the kind of hateful rhetoric that motivated the 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 activity at Charlottesville, that terrible incident, and motivated, you know, Trump getting elected in the first place. Um, so, I mean, I would just say I'm, I'm going to post some, some evidence here. If anyone's interested in, in this, I think it's a very... I think it's very hard to challenge the case that this had that automation didn't play a decisive role. It was not the whole picture. It was not the only factor, but automation sort of set the stage. These this this behind the scenes thing of automation going through that buzzsaw, eliminating all of these common jobs in the economy, the financial stress that creates, the scarcity mindset that creates hatred and bigotry, the the abandonment of the Democratic Party of its own base. And the Republican Party seemingly coming in with solutions, even though they were terrible solutions, build the build the wall, you know, turn the clock backwards. All of those things, in a way, automation is the 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 glue. It's the thing that's driving the whole thing. That's Yang's argument. And I don't think that's politically naive, because as Yang points out, what are we hearing from the mainstream media? We're hearing that it was Russia. We're hearing that it was election meddling. We're hearing that it was we should blame Facebook or 4chan or the FBI when we all know that that's that's nonsense um you know this this election as i said before is a cry for help and somebody does need to do address those problems and i think yang's assessment of the situation is actually pretty politic politically savvy in my opinion all right y'all that's all i have for you today we'll be back um in a few days we're going to be talking about some more of Yang's policies. We're going to be talking about more goings on with the uh, upcoming campaign, more world events, and uh, you know, recent horror story I heard um, having to do with law enforcement going on in uh, New Mexico. And uh, yeah, anyway, thank you all for tuning in so much in this first episode. Uh, humanity first, guys. Thank you for listening to Human Centered Politics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. The idea of the Tao is the ruler who abdicates and lets all the people, trusts all the people to conduct their own affairs. This doesn't mean, you see, that there isn't a unified organism and everything is in chaos. It means that the more liberty you give, the more love you give, the more you allow things in yourself and in your surroundings to take place the more order you will have.